I always, I always love confirmation and baptisms and, and uh, memberships because it, it reminds me uh, to reaffirm my faith and wherever I am in my journey to kind of re-up and recommit and, and re-engage uh, that faith that God has planted in me. You know, com- confirmation is, is this owning of your faith. It's this public confession and it's this recognition that the promise that God made on your lives and on all of our lives is a yes in Jesus. Now, John Wesley, who is kind of the founder of this movement we call the United Methodist Church today, he had some rules for living for those of us who had said yes to Jesus. And the rules were pretty simple. They were do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. Uh, One of our United Methodist bishops wrote a book called Three Simple Rules. And I love it because it's really short and really small. This is the kind of book I like to read. Right? Um, but it's really just a description of how we, as faithful Jesus followers, live out our mission and vision in these three simple rules to do no harm, to do good, and to stay in love with God. And it's that last rule that I want to talk about today. What does it look like for us to stay in love with God? To nurture that relationship we have with God, to have this faith that lasts a lifetime, a faith that can withstand the storms and the disappointments and the challenges of life, a a, a faith that can walk with us through the most difficult moments. How do we stay in love with God during those times? The book of Hebrews, chapter 10. If you brought a Bible with me, I want to invite you to go there, even if you got it on your phone, because I just think this is one of my very favorite parts of Scripture. Hebrews, chapter 10, starting at verse 19. Here's what it says. It says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have the confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open to us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, in other words, because of Jesus, here's how we stay in love with God. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with a full assurance that faith brings. And having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the, a guilty conscience and our, having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. For me, as I read this passage, what I hear the writer of Hebrews saying is, here are five practices you can implement in your life that will help you stay in love with God. Here are five opportunities for you to practice these things so that you can stay connected to God during the life's hard times and the challenges of life. And the first one I love, it says, draw near to God. Draw near to God. To God. Now, now let me ask you, as you hear that, who's doing the moving? We are, right? Draw near to God. It means God's here, and I need to draw near to God. I'm doing the moving. Now, I'm going to guess that many of you are guilty like I am guilty of saying, hey, God, if you could just come over here and join me in what I'm doing, that'd be great. Right? Hey, God, if you could get on board with the idea I have, that would be really excellent. Hey, God, if you could just answer the prayer the way I want you to answer it, that would be amazing. But that isn't what this passage says at all, right? It's not about asking God to join us in what we're doing. It's about drawing near to God. See, we want God to draw near to us. And the whole time the Scripture is saying that we are the ones who have to move. We're the ones who have to change. We're the ones who have to adjust. 
We want God to join us in what we're doing. And the whole time, God's saying, hey, you know what? I'm doing something pretty amazing over here. Why don't you join me? There's room for you over here. We want God to bless what we're doing. And the whole time, God is saying, hey, listen, you know what? You could just go ahead and be a part of the blessing I'm doing over here. And it'd be ten times better than anything you could come up with on your own. So for me, that first practice that I have to work on is moving towards God. To identifying where God is and moving towards God. Now, this one comes with a warning. I just want to warn you up front. This one can. In confirmands, I want you to listen to me. I'm talking right to you guys today, all right? Here's the deal. God doesn't spend a whole lot of time in comfort zones, convenient places, or with popular people. I'm just saying. If you want to draw near to God, you're going to have to go where God is going. And as I read scripture, where I see God spending most of God's time is with the poor and the sick and the marginalized and the hurting and the needy and the lonely. Where God is spending God's time is in the hard places, the hopeless places, the dark places, the broken places. And so if you want to draw near to God, you better be prepared to go there. And I want to apologize to our young confirmands because sometimes as a church, we don't always do a good job of being honest. Sometimes we say, hey, you know, come to church, follow Jesus, and everything will be rainbows and unicorns, right? It's going to be wonderful all the time. Your bank account will always be full. Your refrigerator will always be stocked. Your spouse will always be happy, and the doctor will always have good news. And then it doesn't happen. And what happens to faith, right? Right? What happens to our faith? Dietrich Bonhoeffer called that cheap grace. Now hear me, y'all. Grace is free, but it's not cheap. Well, let me say that again. Some of y'all need to write that down. Grace is free, but it is not cheap. As a matter of fact, it just may cost you everything. Jesus put it this way. If anyone wants to come after me, did you hear the language? If anyone wants to draw near to me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will find it for my sake. For what does it profit a person who gains the whole world and forfeits their soul? Or what shall a person give in return for their soul? Oh, friends, the call of staying in love with God is about drawing near to God. But make no mistake, when you draw near to God, it'll be a challenge. It might be the hardest thing you've ever done. But can I make you a promise? It'll be worth it. It'll be worth it. Now, the second practice the writer of Hebrews tells us to do is hold on to hope. And I love that language of holding on to hope, because how many of you know hope is slippery? Right? It's like that bar of soap in the shower. You know, hope is slippery. It's so easy to lose hope when things aren't going the way we thought they ought to. It's so easy to lose hope when life gets hard. This week, many of you know that our United Methodist Church had some challenging conversations. We've been talking about the issues of human sexuality and how the church understands the Bible and how our, what is our call to live in, in our world today. And so last weekend, the, the church kind of got together and had a meeting. And can I just say, maybe it wasn't our finest hour. Can I just be honest to say that we weren't always grace-filled in our conversation? We weren't always offering our best selves to one another, 
during that conversation. As a matter of fact, it got a little ugly there for a time. And, and so I'm hearing from all of my friends in churches all over the country, my, my conservative friends and my progressive friends and my centrist friends, and they're all kind of saying, what is wrong with our church? Our church is broken. And there seems to be this sense of helplessness and hopelessness. On Tuesday, on the day it got most difficult for me, I ran across this passage in Hebrews when I decided to preach on this verse. And it said, hold on to hope. You know why? Not because I have hope in our legislative process. Not because I have hope in some sort of outcome of some vote somewhere. Not because I have hope in denominations or bishops or other people. Not because I have hope in worldly systems or political systems. Not because I have hope in anything else. But I have hope because the Bible says, He who promised is faithful. Can I get an amen on that? He who promised is faithful. Friends, that's where my hope is. Now, next Sunday, I'm going to be inviting those of you who would be interested in a conversation about what's going on in our denomination. At 4 o'clock, we'll meet in here um, next Sunday and uh, chat through some of that. But I want you to know, as challenging as these conversations can be sometimes, I have hope. Not because I'm a good guy but because he who promised is faithful. And what I've come to believe is that as long as there is breath in my lungs, there's hope, right? As long as the Holy Spirit is moving among us, there is hope. As long as faithful people are following Jesus, there is hope. Hope And as long as God is on the throne, friends, there is always hope. Because he who promised is faithful. And, and just one more word about hope. Did you notice how the writer didn't just say hold on to hope? The writer said hold unswervingly to hope. Hold unswervingly to hope. Picture this. Picture this. You're, you're headed for a headlong collision. You can't go right. You can't go left. What do you do? Hold on to hope. It's that kind of hope we're called to hold on to. Here's the way I picture it in my head. Put hope in a headlock. Put hope in a headlock. Because y'all, hope is slippery. And when we let go when we lose our grip on hope or when we place our hope in things that ultimately fail we miss God's best for our lives so you want to stay in love with God hold on to hope the third thing it teaches us here in Hebrews is that we need to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Now, I think that's a that's a neat way to say that. Um, but can I be honest? How many of you, the minute you hear the word spur, you think of like Clint Eastwood, right? <laughs> that's how I'm gonna just ching, 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 right? And I haven't spent a lot of time wearing spurs, riding horses, doing the whole cowboy thing. But I've watched enough Clint Eastwood movies to know a little something about what spurs are for. Spurs are those really sharp little knife-like things you wear on the back of your boots that are designed to tell your horse when to go and when to stop, right? When to go right, when to go left, what's the direction and the to give your horse guidance. That's what spurs are for. Not just to sound cool when you walk into the saloon, right? That's what spurs are for. And can I be honest here for a second? Spurs hurt. That's the way they work. They're not tickling your horse, right? Spurs hurt. So what's this verse saying? Spur one another on. Part of our call as community, and Confirmance, part of our call to be in this community 
is that we're called to spur one another on, to hold each other accountable. When I see you getting a little out of bounds, it's my job not to go just, hey, you know, whatever, it's his life. You know, but to speak up and to say, hey, I love you. And because I love you, I need to say something that might be a little painful. I can't tell you how often I'll start a conversation in my office by, by asking the question, um, is it okay if I share something a little painful because I love you? And all, most of the time the answer is yes. But most of the time, the results are also painful. See, God's accountability can be painful at times. When God calls us, when God says, yes, go here, or no, don't go there, that accountability can be painful, but it is never harmful. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the difference between hurt and harm. But accountability doesn't have to be mean. It doesn't have to be cruel. It doesn't even have to be brutal, right? We love the phrase brutally honest. You don't have to be brutal, just be honest. What about lovingly honest? Right? Is that okay? Can we do that? In Revelation chapter 3, here's the words equated to Jesus. He said, it says, those I love, I rebuke and discipline. So discipline is a part of our journey with Jesus. Hearing the hard truths, the no's along the way, having the accountability and boundaries in our lives is a part of our journey and keeps us in love with God. So I got two questions when it comes to this one. Do you know somebody who wears the spurs? Right? Do you have somebody in your life who has permission to say the hard things? Not just mean people in your life. We all got those folks. I'm talking about the people who love you enough to tell you the truth. Do you have those people in your life? And here's my second question. Can you be that person for someone else? Can you be that accountability, that spurring one another on? Where? Towards love and good deeds. The fourth thing the writer of Hebrews tells us, in order to stay in love with God, don't give up meeting together. Summer's coming, y'all. Oh, he just went there. Don't give up meeting together. The Bible tells us that there is something powerful that happens when God's people gather together. Now, hear me say, online worship is great. I think it's great. We're actually going to begin implementing that this summer. And, and so we're going to have some opportunities to, for those of you who are traveling to really kind of help you stay engaged and connected. <clears throat> and all that's great. TV preachers, you should all watch them. Some of them. You should, you should all watch them. Personal devotion, I believe, is critical to our faith and to our life together. And can I worship God on the golf course? Oh, I heard it. I heard it. Way to go, Dad. Well trained. He, he said, yeah, you can. Of course, well, you can worship God on the golf course. I get a potty mouth. So anyway, that's a whole other, that's a whole other story. Can we do worship alone? Sure we can. But there is something powerful that happens when we gather in community together. There's something that only happens here. In Romans chapter 1, there's this verse that Paul is on his way to the church in Rome. Paul is like this ministry rock star. He, you think of your spiritual hero, a Billy Graham type, you know, whoever that is in your life. Think about if that person were coming here just to see you. This is the situation. Paul is preparing to come see his friends in Rome. And Paul is the ultimate Bible rock star. And listen to what he writes. He says, I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gifts to you and make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. So think about it this way. Here is Paul 
the rock star of all rock stars, right? And you're thinking he's going to come and he's just going to drop the gospel like it's hot and we're all going to get blessed. And that's the goal, right? But what Paul says is, yeah, that might happen. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly going to come and bring whatever God gives me. But you know what I'm also looking forward to? Being blessed by you. What Paul said is that you are a part of my blessing. That when we are together, you become a part of the way that God speaks and interacts and, and connects with me. That I need you as a part of my blessing so that we can be mutually edified together. Mutually encouraged and blessed. I often hear people say, well, Pastor, I... I just don't feel like coming to church for me. I don't feel good about myself. I don't feel good about, you know, my life. I don't, whatever. There are a hundred reasons why I don't come to church. You know what I often say? I get it. Don't come to church for you. If you don't want to come to church for you, don't. But would you think about something for a second? Would you come for me? Would you come not so much about what you might get out of it or what you might gain from it or how you might be blessed, but would you come knowing that you are a part of my blessing? You are a part of the way I hear God speak. You are a part of the way I see God working in this community. And when you're not here, I miss that. So if you can't come for you, that's okay. Come for me. Maybe that's not enough either. That's okay. But, but we are, there's something that God does when we gather that, is, that can't happen anywhere else. The other thing I hear folks say is, oh, I, can, I don't want to come to church. Church is full of hypocrites. Church, have you heard that before, right? Church is full of hypocrites. And you know what I say to that? You're right. Join us, won't you? Right? Because if you think the church is the social club for the spiritually elite, if you think the church is a place where all the folks who got it figured out come and, and, and share all their wisdom and knowledge together to hide it from you, if you think that's what the church is, you have missed the understanding of the church. I love this, this definition of the church I was given years and years ago, that the church is where broke folk go to gather for healing and hope. That's the church, where all of us hypocrites come together and offer ourselves on the altar of God's grace, where all of us sinners, all of us broken people, all of us in need, all of us imperfect, every one of us who has fallen short of the glory of God, has, God has said, you are welcome in my house. If you're not welcome anywhere else, you're welcome here. So join us. Finally, it tells us that we need to be encouraging of one another. We need to encourage one another. It is so easy to be critical. It's so easy to be judgmental. It's so easy to point fingers and to be negative. What if we chose to be encouragers instead? What if we chose to look for the good in each one, even if it's hidden real deep? What if we chose to lift one another up rather than tearing each other down so that we feel better about ourselves? What if we chose to point out the positive rather than the things we don't like or the things that, that made us uncomfortable, the things we weren't familiar with? What if we chose to be a community who encouraged one another? Oh, well, I'm going to tell you, y'all, there aren't a lot of places like that left in the world. And the world is hungry for someone to fill them with some encouragement. Now, when John Wesley originally wrote his three simple rules, uh, that he used some different language. It was a 16th, uh, 1600, 1700s uh, Anglican priest, so he had some different language other than do good, do no harm, and stay in love with God. That last rule, the way John Wesley put it, was, was attend to the ordinances of God. Attend to the ordinances of God. You know what that means? 
what, what John Wesley said is you want to stay in love with God? Do the things that God's called you to do. The spiritual disciplines, Bible reading, fasting, Holy Communion, baptism, engage in the things that draw you closer to God and watch how you stay in love with God. So today, I'm going to invite you to the same table that Jesus invited his best friends to. The table where Jesus said, this is my body and it's broken for you. The table where after Jesus had fed the disciples, he offered them the cup and he said, guys, listen, this is for all those days you get it wrong. For all those mistakes, for all those days you thought it was about you when it was really about me. For all those days you asked me to draw near to you rather than you drawing near to me. This is a fresh start, a new hope, a new opportunity. This cup represents forgiveness. And so my encouragement today is to do the things that keep you in love with God. Confirmands, I, I want you to know you are on a journey today, and we are so excited to be on this journey with you. I couldn't think of a, a better way to spend my time and spend my life. And we want you to know that, that we're all in this together. Today, um, as we begin to celebrate communion, I want to invite all of you who are able to come. And the communion table in the United Methodist Church is open to all people. You don't have to be a member here. You don't have to be United Methodist. You don't have to have the Bible memorized or Jesus all figured out. Everyone is welcome at God's table, and all means all. Even you. I know, it blows my mind too. But even you are welcome at God's table. 